My pleasure. Um, it's it's uh, really good to hear everyone's voice. And um, I am uh, thrilled to be here again uh, with you all. Um, today's uh, lecture is going to be all about dairy. Um, and uh, the title of the lecture is Are Dairy Products Necessary for Human Health? Um, I won't give you a spoiler alert because I think most of you know the answer, but we're going to talk about why. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, are dairy products necessary for human health? So we got this cute little video showing of, um, but the question we wanna ask is what does the science say? Dairy products are advanced in Western countries as being necessary for human health. They are recommended um, uh, in uh, the dietary guidelines and uh, pushed uh, through industry and marketing initiatives, but these recommendations are the result of aggressive marketing campaigns by the dairy industry. They are absolutely not supported by science. And they are also not supported by mother nature herself. Um, the uh, idea that we are supposed to continue consuming a material that was only intended as uh, a food for babies throughout our lifetime is one of the most um, just absurd behaviors that human beings have ever adopted. And um, it actually creates just um, uh, uh, untold amounts of disease and um, that uh, ultimately results in uh, disability and premature death for literally millions of people. And uh, we really, really need to uh, reconsider this behavior and, uh, and, and just stop it because it is very, very destructive not only for our health, but for the environment and certainly um, uh, for the animals that uh, we abuse by uh, um, uh, uh, forcing them into the slavery that <laughs> um, uh, it takes to, to uh, produce these products. Um, so- Dr. Dr. Mills, pardon the interruption. Um, I think your mouse might be hovered over your screen because we see that tab with all of the Zoom uh, tabs on the bottom. So if you just move your mouse, I think that might clear up the screen a little bit. Actually, um, or is that part you know, of let me, let me, let me, yeah. Um, let me see if I can get this. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I tried to get rid of this thing and, um, uh, Hmm. Let me see if my tech team can jump in and tell us what to do. I know that to do get rid of this. Yeah, I don't. Um, if you move your mouse off, it goes away. I don't want to interrupt your whole presentation. And if we can't get it, that's okay. But we wanted to make sure you knew. Um. Yeah. See, I, I've, yeah. I've I've tried it. Yeah. To make it like. Um, yeah, Doctor Mills. This is John. Um, if you want, um, where it says more, click on more to the right. Uh huh. And then there should be something to hide floating meeting controls. If you click on that, that should hide the, the controls for you. Hide floating. There we go. That's All it. Right. And then, and then the, um, it's, there's perfect. Perfect. All right. Lovely. You know what? I have been doing these presentations for like, I don't know, a million years, and I never knew how to do that. So um, I am in love with you guys now. That is why we um, picked on the big bucks. Yes. <laughs> anyway, that previous slide uh, was from the book of Daniel. It said, give us uh, vegetables to drink, to eat and water to drink. Um, and that was wonderful uh, advice then and still is good advice now. So uh, this slide says, according to evolutionary theory, how old 
is the human species, which um, is defined as being Homo sapiens sapiens. Well, again, according to evolutionary theory, uh, the human species is 100,000 years old. So then the question I want to ask is, how old is the practice of uh, abusing female uh, uh, animals to uh, steal their um, memory secretions? Less than 6,000 years old. So then quite naturally, the question is, if we've been around for, again, according to evolutionary theory, 100,000 years, how the heck did we survive all that time without abusing these animals? If dairy products are so essential, how did human beings exist and survive for 94,000 years without them? Clearly, they're not essential. It's absurd to postulate that we could have survived for so long if dairy was essential. It's not. By the way, I just want you guys to notice that these poor animals are literally covered in their own filth. And as you can see, um, that the feces is getting into um, the udder, it's, it covers their udders, it's getting into uh, the milk that's being uh, um, uh, taken from them. Um, and that is one of the reasons that that milk has to be quote, pasteurized, that is heated up to, I don't know how many hundreds of degrees to try and kill off um, all of the bacteria um, that uh, uh, goes into the milk. So just know that uh, anytime um, people are drinking milk or eating, consuming anything made from cow's milk, they're getting a healthy dose of feces with their milk. So, <clears throat> um, there's an article titled Diet Patterns and Mortality, Common Threads and Consistent Results that was published in the Journal of Nutrition in April 2014 that reviewed four dietary patterns associated with lower risk of death from cardiovascular disease, cancer, or any cause whatsoever. The take-home message from that article was that all four dietary patterns were built on a common core of a diet that was rich in plant foods. So in other words, if you wanted to lower your risk from cardiovascular disease, cancer, or just lower your risk of dying, you needed to build your diet not around dairy, not around meat, not around animal foods. You needed to build your diet around a diet rich in plant foods, whole grains, variety of fruits and vegetables, nuts and legumes. Remember what Daniel said? Give us vegetables to eat and water to drink, not milk, not meat, not cheese. And this was supported by extensive scientific evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, I, you know, look, I, I'm, this is not subtle. This is not a matter of conjecture. This is not up to debate. I'm not here to mess around and, you know, uh, hem and haw. I'm tired of people, you know, acting like we don't know what the truth is. You know, if you want to sit around and eat Popeyes and KFC, you don't do that. But when you drop dead, when your chest starts seizing, when your heart says, I've had it, I'm out of here, then just go in the backyard, lay down and die. But, you know, don't act like you don't understand what's going on or, you know, ask God, why is this happening to me? It's happening because you threw your life away on some foolishness because it's crystal clear what you should be doing if you want to live and you want to be healthy. Okay. It, it, it's just not up to debate anymore. Blue zone data, they, uh, the blue zone data, which we've had again for more than a generation, they went around the world and looked at the places around the world where people lived the longest. Why did they do that? Because, you know, people said, well, you know, maybe when you look in one place where people live the longest, it's because they're all, they just have good genes. So 
maybe we need to, you know, look in different places where people live the longest to see, is there some common thread between these different areas that could account for why people live the longest? Okay, let's do that. Guess what they found? They found that wherever people lived a long time, the common thread was that they were eating a plant-based diet and they remained active throughout their life. And more, even more interestingly, they found that the more plant-based the diet, the longer the people lived and the lower their risk for dementia. And guess where the longest lived population was? Right here in the United States, in Loma Linda, California, where people had, where there was a high population of people who were vegetarian and vegan. So in other words, the longest lived people were the people who were the most plant-based. And that was in Loma Linda, California. And it actually turns out that we probably have a second blue zone uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, where there is a uh, population of vegan, uh, of black vegan Seventh-day Adventists that were, guess what, overlooked when the people were doing the original Blue Zone study. But we have some people who are trying to gather that data now and amend the original study. Um, uh, well, I just covered this. The only Blue Zone is in, in the United States, Loma Linda. Uh, and that's because of the plant-based Adventists. Uh, and they were the longest living of the Blue Zone populations uh, that had been studied. Uh, it was shown that the uh, women lived an average of 6.6 uh, 6 years longer than uh, uh, general population. And the men lived almost a decade longer on average. Doesn't mean that being plant-based um, is not as... Uh, um, beneficial for women. It's just that women outlive men uh, uh, so, you know, so much uh, uh, at baseline that, you know, uh, there just wasn't as much room for improvement. You know, you can uh, sadly only go for so long. So, uh, although just uh, as a little aside, I still have not accepted the fact that I'm not going to be able to figure out a way to just live forever. So I'll let you know how that works out for me. Um, there was another article published in the Journal of Nutrition in 2018 titled Healthy Plant-Based Diets Are Associated with Lower Risk of All-Cause Mortality. Now, I, I find that really a delightful title because it says all-cause mortality. So that means everything from heart disease to cancer to diabetes to, you know, suicide to um, accidental gun deaths, to, you know, um, uh, jumping off a building. I mean, dying from any cause. So if you're plant-based, you are much less likely to, you know, get in a car accident. I mean, anything. Um, so being plant-based means that you have more common sense and you're less likely to do stupid things and that could kill you. Um, so it showed that plant-based diets reduce the risk for dying from any cause, including all of the major chronic illnesses, uh, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, obesity, and other causes. And these diets contained no dairy. Plant-based diets have been consistently shown in medical research over the last 60 plus years to decrease the risk for heart disease, a variety of cancers, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, and obesity. Medical research has also shown the roots of adult chronic disease are laid down in childhood. Okay, um, autopsy studies on kids sadly killed in uh, car accidents or other accidents show that children as, as young as eight years of age can have the beginnings of fatty streaks forming in their arteries if they are eating a standard Western style diet that's high in fat, grease, and cholesterol. Um, uh, children fed diets high in red meat, animal protein, and dairy products are at increased risk for heart disease and hormone related cancers such as breast, prostate uh, cancers as adults and can have up to triple the risk 
for colorectal cancer as long as 65 years after having been exposed to dairy products and red meat uh, in their youth. So ladies and gentlemen, you got to be careful what you're feeding your children if you love them. I'm sorry. Um, you know, uh, taking your kids to McDonald's and uh, Burger King or wherever is not a benign process. You're setting these kids up for a lifetime of misery. Moreover, studies have also consistently shown that obese kids, guess what? Grow into obese adults. Uh, as I said, autopsy studies have shown children eating the standard American diet or the SAD diet that have been killed in accidents show these fatty arterial streaks and other lesions um, that eventually develop into uh, a cardiovascular disease. In the summary of the third export, I mean, I'm sorry, expert report that was published in 2012, sponsored by the World Cancer Research Fund, and the American Institute for Cancer Research was a joint study. The report again emphasized the link between preventable dietary exposures and cancer risk. Dietary, physiologic, lifestyle factors that increased risk were the usual suspects. Um, Claude Rains and Humphrey Bogart would be proud. The usual suspects, red and processed meat, Heme iron, which is found in animal foods, high amounts of sodium, alcohol, obesity, chronic inflammation, and sitting on the couch uh, with the remote in your hand, the lack of exercise. Protective dietary components were, again, guess what? Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, both soluble and insoluble dietary fiber, which is only found in plant foods, plant-derived vitamins and antioxidants such as vitamin C, E, selenium, and folate, phytochemicals such as your carotenoids, um, diethiothionates, isothiocyanates, uh, flavonoids, and phenols, just to name a few. And those last unpronounceable compounds are the things that give um, berries and uh, uh, fruits and uh, vegetables, their colors. So anything with beautiful, deep colors are the things that confer the kind of protection on us that will protect us from disease and help us to ward off uh, um, dementia, um, heart disease, infection, and help us to live a long life. In addition, the report urged the elimination of calorie dense, high energy foods like sugar sweetened beverages and foods high in total and saturated fat and trans fat, I might add, uh, both to lower disease risk and reduce obesity. So let's talk about milk, okay? Because mammalian milks are designed to be species specific foods for the infants that are born to a particular mother. And as a result, mammalian milks provide the correct ratio of nutrients for that particular species infant. The milks are designed to stimulate the growth and boost the immune function of what? That particular species infant. Carnivore infants require milk that has a lot more energy and protein than herbivore and, uh, uh, or human milk because carnivore infants are born at an extremely immature state of development. Why is that? It's because carnivore females cannot carry their infants for very long because they have to hunt in order to get food. And so carnivore infant uh, uh, females deliver their infants by 14 to 15 weeks of pregnancy, which is basically, um, you know, two to three months. And they have they, they deliver the babies and the babies essentially complete their development outside the womb, whereas by contrast, herbivores carry their infants for 36 to 40 weeks or more. 
meaning that they invest a lot more time and energy into carrying their infants to a much uh, more mature state of development. And so as a result, these carnivore milks are much richer, contain a lot more energy, a lot more protein, a lot more fat than the herbivores do. So you can see that from uh, these charts. Um, you look at the amount of total solids, the amount of fat, the amount of protein, and you compare that to the two um, uh, plant eaters down at the bottom, and you see across the board, the carnivores have a lot more total solids, much higher uh, fat content, and um, a lot more protein. Um, uh, and But what's really interesting is um, look at the two plant eaters at the bottom. Um, cows and humans have roughly the same amount of solids, right? They also have essentially the same amount of fat. Um, and you might say, wow, humans and cows have very similar milk, not on your life. And I'm going to show you that uh, in greater detail and, and, um, uh, uh, and, and these upcoming slides. The type of fat that's in cow's milk is complete, is very different from the type of fat in human milk. Uh, I'm sure that the people listening to this lecture have probably seen human milk. Human milk is very thin looking and has a translucent quality. Whereas whole cow's milk is opaque. It's very white and, and um, you can't see through it. Moreover, you can take whole cow's milk and you can churn it and get butter out of it, or you can take it and make ice cream. And that's because much of the fat that's in cow's milk is highly saturated fat. It will turn into solid at, uh, into a solid at room temperature, or you, it will um, uh, rise to the top and become this thick cream. Uh, you can't do that with human milk. You can't make butter out of it. You can't make ice cream out of it. When you look at the protein content of uh, uh, cow's milk versus uh, human milk, cow's milk has uh, almost three times as much protein as human milk. Why is that? It's because protein is not used for energy. Proteins are building blocks. And a baby cow is growing much faster than a baby human. Humans are the slowest growing animals on this planet, uh, and certainly amongst the mammals. It takes a human infant 18 years to reach maturity. A baby calf will go from about 60 to 80 pounds at birth to 1,200 pounds in three years. Well, 1,200 to 2,000 pounds in three years. It's growing at a phenomenal rate, so it needs a whole lot more um, protein than in humans. But look at the amount of lactose, which is super interesting. Now, um, a human baby at birth, you know, a good-sized baby is maybe six to eight pounds. Um, babies that are larger than that really are too big. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute too. Um, so, you know, you've got a calf versus a human baby. The calf is like 10 to 12 times uh, the size of uh, um, uh, a human baby at birth. Yet proportionately, the human baby has um, one and a half times as much sugar as the cow, as, as the calf. Well, why is that? Well, it's the sugar is not used for energy for the muscles. It's used for the brain. The brain likes nothing but sugar for its metabolism. And the human infant has the largest brain in proportion to its body size of any uh, uh, infant. And it needs much more sugar for its metabolism. And when you feed a baby human with something other than its mother's milk, you are, in a sense, starving its brain of energy. And, you know, that may explain why some of these people who insist on feeding their babies uh, cow's milk end up with, you know, knuckleheads uh, as adults. 
Um, that's just my theory. Anyway, <clears throat> mammalian milts are species specific endocrine signaling, si signaling systems that activate these growth genes called mTOR genes and other cellular proliferative, proliferative genes and suppress cell destruction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that we've now discovered that mammalian milks have in them uh, messenger RNA fragments from the mother, mRNA fragments, that actually help program the baby's genes. And, you know, now that we're all familiar with mRNA from these uh, uh, vaccines that we all have taken to try and ward off COVID, we know just how um, bioactive mRNA is. Well, now we realize that all of these mRNA fragments that are in milk are there to help jumpstart the baby's physiology. Well, spoil, I mean, you know, uh, I, I don't know how to phrase this. It's like, what the heck are we doing to ourselves by ingesting all of these bovine mRNA fragments? What are we telling our genes to do? You know, no wonder so many human beings look like cows. Um, and, you know, normally the type of sustained gene activation that comes from ingesting milk should only be occurring during the rapid growth phase that um, happens during infancy. But when people are drinking milk throughout their lifetime, they are telling their genes to do things that they shouldn't be doing during their adulthood, and that is trying to grow. And that is one of the reasons that we see that ingestion of dairy products are associated with things like cancer and uh, inflammation and other proliferative problems like the metabolic syndrome, uh, um, obesity, acne, and uh, other uh, um, tumor uh, type developments, both benign and cancerous, uh, um, that happen in, in societies where people are uh, uh, continuing to consume uh, um, uh, dairy products throughout their lifetime. Uh, dairy consumption is the most abnormal dietary practice humans engage in. Nowhere else in nature do you see any mammalian species continuing to consume dairy products throughout its lifetime at all, and let alone the dairy uh, 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 products of a different species. This is perverse. It is just bizarre. It makes no sense whatsoever. And the fact that we have normalized it does not make it normal. And, and, and we need to get that through our heads. It, it is just, it is just, it is just unreal what we're doing to ourselves and to our children. So let's look at human breast milk composition. So human breast milk has a very high carbohydrate content, a very high fat content because the baby uh, does eat energy, but it has a very low protein content. And remember, I said proteins are building blocks. So why does the human uh, uh, breast milk have such a low protein content? Because humans are very slow growing. We, our babies don't need a lot of protein. They don't grow very fast. And it turns out that one of the reasons people got so, uh, early nutrition researchers got so screwed up in terms of their ideas about what constituted good quality protein and how much protein um, people needed was because they took, um, uh, rats and um, tried, to tried to raise baby rats on uh, human milk and, uh, or excuse me, on plant uh, protein and found that the baby rats didn't do well on plant protein. They didn't grow well. Um, and they concluded that, oh, well, that means that those plant proteins weren't good quality protein. Well, no, it just meant that the plant proteins weren't concentrated enough for those baby rats. But the fact is that if you fed those baby rats uh, human breast milk, they would die as well. 
because human breast milk doesn't have enough protein for baby rats because baby rats are growing too fast for the amount of protein in human milk. If you, um, if let's say uh, there's a family where they have a, 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 a family dog and um, um, the mother of the family is pregnant and the dog is pregnant and um, they both give birth at the same time, but um, the, 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 the dog, uh, the female dog sadly uh, dies and the mother says, well, you know, she only had two puppies and I got my baby over here. And so I'm going to just, you know, express enough milk, uh, milk to feed the baby. And also I'll uh, try to nurse the puppies. Those puppies would die trying to uh, nurse on human milk because there's not enough protein in the mother's milk to keep those puppies alive. OK, um, now, if the reverse were done. Um, if the mother, let's just say she couldn't produce enough milk to feed her baby, but she decided, well, you know what, I must take some of this milk from my dog and feed my baby. Um, the baby would stay alive because there's so much protein and fat in that dog's milk. It would, uh, feed the baby. It's kind of just kind of gross and disgusting, but, um, it, it would, it would also not be good for the baby because that's just way more than the baby needs. But, my point is that um, the the it that there's not enough protein in human milk to sustain a carnivore or even a baby rat, um, but it's enough to sustain a baby human because humans are so slow growing. All right. Well, let's look at cow's milk compared to human milk. Um, oh, let me um, hasten to say, these slides I'm showing you, they are from Dr. Jackie uh, Bussey, who is a vegan pediatrician uh, from California. These are her slides, and I want to give her absolute credit for these because they are brilliant, beautiful, wonderful slides. This comes from research that she has done, and she was gracious enough to share them with me. And I absolutely want to give her full credit for this because this is her work. And um, I'm, I, I'm just thrilled that she allowed me to use, use, uh, uh, use these slides because they are just so full of, uh, of wonderful information. So when you look at the protein content of, uh, of cow's milk, what you find is that there is almost five times more protein per kilocalorie. Again, because the baby calf is growing so much faster. And when you look at the casein to whey ratio, there is much more, uh, um, uh, there's seven times more casein in cow's milk versus uh, human milk. Um, and casein is much more uh, growth promoting uh, than, uh, than, than, than whey is. Um, and it, um, it, it promotes much bigger growth uh, um, in, 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 the, uh, in the calves. Um, I might also say that uh, Dr. Bussey pointed out that um, in women who drink cow's milk when they're pregnant, they tend to have bigger babies. OK, the um, their babies at term are significantly larger and people might say, well, what's wrong with that? It's good to have a big, healthy, bouncing baby. No, it's not, because you know what happens? Those women who deliver those bigger babies end up having much more pelvic floor trauma. They have vaginal tears. They have um, trauma to their pelvic floor and they end up having urinary incontinence, um, uh, um, sexual dysfunction uh, as they uh, move throughout their life. Um, and they um, uh, have a lot more problems, um, again, uh, with um, just, again, incontinence, dysfunction, uh, um, uh, uterine prolapse, and other um, 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 uh, uh, sexual health issues because of the trauma that comes from having these abnormally large babies. So none of this is benign, either for the baby or for the mother, because these, again, these big, you know, um, cow-like babies that, that end up have, uh, that these women have 
also end up having more metabolic issues. They tend to be more obese. They tend to have a higher uh, propensity to develop diabetes and other issues as they grow and move through life. So again, ingesting the uh, 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 fluid that was not meant for humans and that was meant for cows uh, creates health problems as they move through life. Um, so when you, uh, again, look at uh, the, the human milk uh, compared to the cow's milk, there's more carbohydrate in the human milk because of the bigger brain. When you don't have that, um, the baby's brain is relatively uh, uh, starved for nutrition. And um, as I said before, uh, yes, the fat is roughly the same, but it's the wrong kind of fat. Uh, and so the, uh, the human baby ends up getting fat. Um, but it uh, ends up causing metabolic derangements uh, um, uh, and that presents problems uh, later in life. Um, and uh, so um, the, the other thing is that it causes um, uh, problems in the micro, developing microbiome because um, the carbohydrates that are in uh, human mother's milk um, have um, uh, what are called oligosaccharides that help promote the development of a healthy microbiome in the baby. Whereas in cow's milk, you don't have those uh, oligosaccharides. And so you don't select for the right type of bacteria in the baby's uh, colon. And so again, that causes a whole slew of problems. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, you don't select for the right type of bacteria that uh, promote the development of a healthy immune system. You don't select for the right type of bacteria that uh, create the right type of, of uh, um, uh, neurotransmitters. Um, uh, you don't select for the right type of bacteria that um, uh, uh, suppressed pathogenic species of bacteria. So again, we end up setting our babies up for all sorts of health problems because we don't start them out properly um, by giving them what they really need because we give them the wrong type of food. Um, and uh, it, it's, just, it's just tragic because we, we, we've been doing the wrong thing for so long. And again, all of these slides that are ringed in blue come from Dr. Bustin. Uh, and this is what I was telling you before about the fatty acid composition that uh, the cow's milk is just filled with um, all of these, the saturated fat, whereas human milk has a lot less saturated fat, more mono and polyunsaturated fats, which are uh, much less likely to uh, form uh, blockages and fatty streaks in the arteries. Uh, of, of, of the human baby. And then uh, looking at the milk driven growth patterns, um, uh, this is what I was telling you earlier about the increase in birth weight uh, uh, in the women who drink milk during pregnancy, they have these bigger babies, which result in more um, birth trauma, uh, which uh, causes a lot of uh, problems uh, for them later in life. And then kids who drink cow, cow's, cow's milk, they also grow bigger, faster, but um, that work, uh, results in increased disease risk uh, because it activates uh, these mTOR genes, which um, cause accelerated aging, um, cell proliferation. It causes earlier onset of age-related diseases. Um, cow's milk induces higher magnitude of mTOR activation than uh, human milk. And it just makes these kids grow bigger, faster, which again causes earlier onset of puberty, uh, which will set them up again for a higher risk for breast and prostate cancer, uh, colon cancer, heart disease, uh, and type 2 diabetes. Um, Plant-based kids, on the other hand, they experience a slower growth rate in earlier child childhood that results in a later onset of puberty or menarche. Um, they have a later and a slower growth spurt, uh, 
um, and a longer growth period. But, and this is super important, they ultimately uh, reach their normal size. And some studies suggest they actually end up um, slightly taller than uh, would be predicted um, uh, based on their genetic profile, but they do it at a lower body weight, which again um, um, uh, means that they are at a reduced uh, um, long-term disease risk, and that correlates with improved health and increased longevity. So that slower growth uh, uh, rate results in better health throughout their lifetime and a lower long-term disease risk. So you see being plant-based is so much better for your kids because it is what should be normal for human beings. This, you know, bigger, faster, heavier is not what we're supposed to be doing and it shouldn't, it's not what we're supposed to be doing to our kids. We're killing our kids. It's just disgusting. Um, uh, and, and we're turning our kids into these little human cows and it's just not good for them. All right. And then, um, I, I, I saw this ad and, and I'm going to use this word because it pissed me off for so many reasons. Number one, they are using black and, 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 and Asian athletes. And when you know the statistics behind lactose intolerance, it, it just, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I wanted to like, I, I wanted to do General Sherman and just march through some places and burn some places down. First of all, 73%, 73 to 74% of African-Americans are lactose intolerant, um, cannot digest that crap. Uh, up 90 to 95% of Asian-Americans are lactose intolerant. 53% of Hispanic Americans are lactose intolerant versus only 30% of Caucasian Americans, meaning that we drink milk, we are going to get gastrointestinal distress, uh, cramping, bloating. We cannot digest this crap. And then to put out these ads suggesting that somehow milk is good for athletes is pure equine excrement. I mean, it's just not true. Moreover, there is nothing, absolutely nothing in cow's milk that is good for exercise or that in any way enhances exercise uh, performance. Amongst terrestrial mammals, mammalian milks are designed and utilized as a growth media. They are not exercise substrates or in any way performance enhancers. During the time most mammalian infants are exclusively nursing, they remain immobile. They're, being, they're hiding in the bushes or their mothers just leave them, you know, sort of uh, 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 hiding somewhere. They are using the milk to grow, not to run around and exercise. Actively exercising muscle primarily burns carbohydrate, uh, but milks actually contain limited amounts of carbohydrates. And that is really usually targeted to the brain. Um, as mammalian young become more active, that's when they began to eat their species design or defined uh, diets. And that's true even of the carnivores. While the carnivore infants are exclusively nursing, they're stuck in the den. Once they start coming out of the den, that's when they start feeding on, you know, the meat that the parents are bringing back. Um, but when they're exclusively nursing, they're stuck in a den. They're not, they're not uh, uh, eating their, their, their regular diet. So this is complete crap to try and, and, and dupe people into thinking that somehow milk is some kind of exercise fuel. That is utter, utter, utter nonsense. And, and I guess you could spell that U-D-D-E-R. Um, infants continue to nurse for a time while eating a regular diet because it helps them grow, but it is the consumed food that provides the muscle fuel and the antioxidants and phytochemicals necessary for post-exercise recovery, not the milk. There are a ton of health problems that have been associated with ingestion of cow's milk, including asthma, asthma exacerbation, 
uh, and this is particularly true for um, uh, African Americans, an African American child, five times more likely to end up in the emergency room with an asthma exacerbation than uh, a white child. And we know that um, consumption of dairy products is uh, um, uh, intimately associated with the uh, uh, exacerbation of, of, of asthma, sinusitis, um, because of uh, uh, the um, uh, acceleration of mucus production. Dairy products can markedly increase um, the uh, or exacerbate uh, the um, um, uh, effect of sinusitis. And just to um, talk about why would that be? Uh, again, um, mother's milk has a couple things that it needs to do for an infant. One, of course, is make the infant grow. But the other thing it has to do is it has to jumpstart that infant's immune system. Well, what is one of the primary ways your respiratory tree protects itself from infection? It's mucus production. Because it's a mucus that traps dirt and bacteria that prevent it from getting down into your lungs or into your sinuses. So one of the things mother's milk does is it teaches uh, or programs the baby's respiratory tree, including the sinuses, the sinuses, excuse me, and the, you know, uh, bronchioles and, 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 and uh, uh, um, bronchial tree to ramp up its mucus production. Well, you know, that's great if you're an infant and you don't have a whole lot of mucus, but if you already have a functioning respiratory tree or sinuses, and then you uh, over-program it to produce even more mucus, that's when you start to clog up your sinuses, you start to overproduce mucus in your respiratory tree, which it then becomes clogged up and the inflammation causes it to spasm down and suddenly you can't breathe and you're having an asthma attack or uh, 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 sinus inflammation and you're miserable. Uh, uh, ingestion of cow's milk before the age of one year has been associated with a marked increase in the risk of developing type one diabetes. This has to do with the fact that um, very young infants do not have their full complement of protein digesting enzymes. And that's so that they can absorb intact um, uh, antibodies from their mother in their mother's milk. And so they only break up proteins into large fragments. And that's uh, why they don't digest the antibodies, which are proteins from their mother. But what that, excuse me, what that also means is that they um, will break up a protein in cow's milk called um, um, bovine serum albumin, BSA, into large fragments, which in susceptible individuals will cause the baby's immune system to make antibodies that can cross react with proteins on the surface of the baby's beta cells on its pancreas that, and the beta cells are the ones that make um, insulin. And um, in those susceptible individuals, if they make those antibodies, those antibodies will kill uh, all of their beta cells and they will end up with type one diabetes, meaning that they uh, will no longer be able to make any insulin. And as a result, they develop type one diabetes and for the rest of their lives, they have to take insulin shots. And that's why the American Academy of Pediatrics tells parents, do not expose your child to cow's milk until they are more than a year old. Because um, after one year of age, children are making all of their protein digesting enzymes, and they can then uh, essentially chop all ingested proteins up into their individual amino acids. And the risk of uh, that um, um, BSA induced uh, type one diabetes goes down markedly, it doesn't go to zero because we know that there's still a risk uh, associated uh, of developing type one diabetes associated with the ingestion of cow's milk that continues throughout childhood, but it is reduced. Um, but again, 
it, it, it's still there. So uh, obviously the safest thing is just not to give your child uh, uh, cow's milk. Um, uh, t- acne is, um, uh, again, uh, definitely associated with uh, drinking cow's milk. Um, uh, and it has to do with the hormones that are in the milk uh, and the inflammation that is caused uh, by uh, cow's milk. And then there's something called cow's milk protein allergy. Uh, recent studies have shown that cow's milk um, allergy is now the leading cause of allergy in children. It is superseded peanuts and everything else. Um, and it can be really severe in a lot of kids. It can cause uh, uh, diarrhea, um, uh, anemia from inflammation in the digestive tract that can cause bleeding um, and uh, can cause skin dermatitis. So uh, the ingestion of these foreign proteins in the cow's milk uh, is not benign. You may have even seen um, uh, advertisements on TV for this uh, um, new type of milk. I, I forget what they call it, but it's it's a protein reduced milk that is supposed to be less allergic. It's, which I, I'm like, if you got to do all this crap to this uh, uh, cow's milk to try and make it uh, acceptable, it, it, isn't that telling you that you need to stay away from it? I mean, it, it's just it's just idiotic that. That, that people are willing to, to jump through all these hoops to try and, 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 and continue to ingest something that they shouldn't be drinking in the first place. I tell people all the time, you shouldn't drink cow's milk for the same reason that if you needed a blood transfusion, I wouldn't transfuse cow's blood into you. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, mammalian milks contain bioactive species specific mRNA fragments. Research done over the last 10, 15 years has shown that mammalian milks contain these bioactive messenger RNA fragments that affect and alter the infant mammal's physiology. Researchers are still working to fully uncover exactly how these mRNA sequences affect gene expression in these nourishing animals. It is also not clear to what extent the mRNA fragments may have activity across species. Some studies have suggested that they may not affect humans, but others studies have uh, hinted at exactly the opposite uh, conclusion that in fact, they do affect our physiology and can um, uh, change and alter our gene expression. Um, And if in fact, it is ultimately found that these mRNA sequences do alter our gene expression in human children and adults, it would help explain some of the deleterious effects that consumption of cow's milk and other dairy products are known to have on human health and physiology. It may be that by consuming cow's milk, we are in fact programming ourselves to become bovids or cows instead of humans with disastrous consequences. So what about bone health, right? Because everybody says, well, you know, you need to uh, drink cow's milk so you can get your calcium, which is a bunch of hooey. And, you know, the idea is that you don't want to end up like these pork chickens here at the boneless chicken ranch with uh, no solid bones. So I ask you, do you got osteoporosis? Well, aggressive marketing by the dairy industry suggests that the best way to protect your bones is by consuming dairy products on a regular basis. But guess what? These claims are not. Not, 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 not based on science. By the way, I got a little message a minute ago that somebody had their hand raised up. Um, I'm going to ask you to write your question down. Save that question until um, we get to the question and answer section, and then we'll get to it. Um, dairy calcium, again, get this. I don't care if you don't remember nothing else I said from this lecture. Dairy calcium has never, 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 ever, never, ever been shown to decrease the risk for osteoporosis. Okay, do you hear me? Dairy calcium has never, never been shown to decrease the risk for osteoporosis. All of that crap about uh, milk uh, 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 building your skeleton is complete male bovine fertilizing. In fact, the Harvard Nurses Health Study showed that the women who drank the most milk had the highest risk for hip fracture. 
A variety of plant foods contain abundant calcium. Cows get calcium from green plants. They don't drink milk and there's plenty of calcium in their milk. Moose and other deer grow antlers made out of solid bone. The, uh, a rack of antlers on an adult moose weigh 85 pounds. A human skeleton from a six foot man only weighs about 25 pounds. These moose grow these antlers in three months. They're made of solid bone, weigh up to 85 pounds, and all they eat are green plants. You do not need milk to build bone. Get that out of your mind. That is just a bunch of nonsense created by the dairy industry to dupe you into sucking on the teats of another animal for no good reason. So if you got milk, you just might have osteoporosis, okay? If you think about it, all the animals and most of the other humans in the world show that liquid sources of calcium are simply not the best way to obtain calcium throughout your lifetime, nor is it the best way to build a strong adult skeleton. The rest of the mammals in the world don't drink milk throughout their lives. They stop drinking milk once they're weaned. It is just idiotic to think that you're supposed to drink milk all your life. This is crazy. Milk is for babies, period. Okay, just saying. So let's look at some, some data. This shows the incidence of hip fracture versus consumption of cow's milk. Guess what? The more milk you drink, the higher your risk of hip fracture. Duh. Age adjusted hip fracture incidence in adult women versus animal protein intake. Guess what? In the countries where they eat the most animal protein, they have the most hip fractures. I mean, I'm telling you people, I'm so tired of the, the misinformation and the misleading, you know, data. I, I, I could I could just bay at the, you know, at the moon. Our bodies don't store protein. So there is absolutely no benefit to eating a diet full of protein. All you're doing is flushing calcium down the toilet. So there's no advantage to consuming protein in excess of your daily needs. All protein that is not utilized for actually building uh, tissue ends up being converted into carbohydrate. And because animal proteins are not buffered, the sulfur that's in these, uh, uh, the excess protein is metabolized to acid, um, and, that and that causes calcium to be um, mobilized from your bones to end so that the phosphate can neutralize that acid, and that ends up weakening your, bone, weakening your bones uh, and contributing to the development of osteoporosis and ultimately hip fractures. Plant proteins are always buffered by phosphate, and therefore, they don't cause excess acid production or significant calcium loss, even when eaten in excess, and uh, have not been shown to increase the risk for developing osteoporosis. And as a result, vegan women have been shown to have stronger bones both before and after menopause than women that eat meat. Milk does not build strong bones. First of our videos. Milk is touted to build strong bones, but a compilation of all the best studies found no association between milk consumption and hip fracture risk, so drinking milk as an adult may not help bones. But what about in adolescents? Harvard researchers decided to put it to the test. Studies have shown that greater milk consumption during childhood and adolescence contributes to peak bone mass, and is therefore expected to help avoid osteoporosis and bone fractures in later life. But that's not what they found. Milk consumption during teenage years was not associated with a lower risk of hip fracture, and if anything, milk consumption was associated with a borderline increase in fracture risk in men. 
It appears that the extra boost in total body bone mineral density you get from getting extra calcium is lost within a few years, even if you keep the calcium supplementation up. Uh, this suggests a partial explanation for the long-standing enigma that hip fracture rates are highest in populations with the greatest milk consumption. Uh, maybe an explanation why they're not lower, but why would they be higher? This enigma irked a Swedish research team puzzled because studies again and again had shown a tendency of higher risk of fracture with a higher intake of milk. Well, there is a rare birth defect called galactosemia, where babies are born without the enzymes needed to detoxify the galactose found in milk. So they end up with elevated levels of galactose in their blood, which can cause bone loss even as kids. So maybe, the Swedish researchers figured, even in normal people that can detoxify the stuff, it might not be good for the bones to be drinking it every day. And galactose doesn't just hurt the bones. That's what scientists use to cause premature aging in lab animals. They slip them a little galactose, and you can shorten their lifespan, cause oxidative stress, inflammation, brain degeneration, uh, just with like the equivalent of you know, one to two glasses of milk's worth of galactose a day. We're not rats, though, but given the high amount of galactose in milk, recommendations to increase milk intake for, for prevention of fractures could be a conceivable contradiction, so they decided to put it to the test, looking at milk intake and mortality, as well as fracture risk, to test their theory. 100,000 men and women followed for up to 20 years. What did they find? Milk-drinking women had, the high, had higher rates of death, more heart disease, significantly more cancer for each glass of milk. Three glasses a day was associated with nearly twice the risk of death, and they had significantly more bone and hip fractures too. Men in a separate study also had a higher rate of death with higher milk consumption, but at least they didn't have higher fracture rates. So a dose-dependent higher rate of both mortality and fracture in women, and a higher rate of mortality in men with milk intake. But the opposite for other dairy products like soured milk and yogurt, which would go along with the galactose theory, since bacteria can ferment away some of the lactose. To prove it, though, we need a randomized controlled trial to examine the effect of milk intake on mortality and fractures. As the accompanying editorial pointed out, uh, we better figure this out soon, as milk consumption is on the rise around the world. Let me just say I want to thank my buddy, Dr. Michael Greger and his amazing, wonderful um, website, nutritionfacts.org. Uh, if you are not a subscriber, please subscribe to that website. It is absolutely free, all science-based, fantastic, ama amazing website. Uh, just phen phenomenal, phenomenal work. So again, cow's milk consumption, type 1 diabetes in different countries, consistent, consistent results. The more milk peop, uh, a country drinks, it uh, doesn't matter what country, the more they drink, the more type 1 diabetes, uh, consistent around the world. Association of cow's milk consumption, multiple sclerosis. Again, consistent result. The more milk, the higher the rate of uh, MS. Again, very scary, but very consistent. So, well, what is in cow's milk? Well, it's full of hormones. We already saw it's full of pus. Uh, because these udders get so inflamed uh, from those machines, it's full of blood, uh, feces, um, it's full of uh, polychloral, biphenyls, persistent organic pollutants, flame retardants from all the uh, stuff that's in the environment, pesticide residues that are on the feed that they give the uh, animals. And then because they're trying to keep the cows from dying from uh, antibiotics, I mean, from uh, infections, they're full of antibiotics. And then, of course, the bovine proteins. None of it is good. Um, there, uh, when they've analyzed milk, they've found as many as 135 million pus cells, the blood, the feces, up to 20 different painkillers, antibiotics, growth hormones, bacteria, 
pathogens, insulin like growth factor, uh, bovine growth hormone, which they, which they give the cows to try and increase their uh, milk production. Um, and that can lead to increased diabetes risk, uh, hormonal imbalance, uh, immune system damage, early puberty, cancer, um, acidic proteins, which leaches mineral and calcium from your bones, toxic milk protein casein, which we talked about earlier, and that contributes to breast cancer, kidney disease, arthritis, MS, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel, asthma, and that's just naming a few. Just, I'm telling you, leave that literal crap alone. Um, and why would you do it when there's so many good plant-based milks um, that uh, could replace it? Um, so uh, there's soy, there's oat, hemp, almond, cashew, rice, cow's milk. Last, uh, in the 2019 um, revision of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, um, the USDA declared that soy milk was nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk is actually much better. Um, but in terms of its uh, uh, protein uh, um, and, and nutrient content, um, because it's got all the good stuff with none of the crap. Uh, and what about calcium? Well, again, you can get calcium from tofu, from tofu, collards, uh, chia seeds, kale, almond, dried figs, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and that stuff tastes so much more delicious. Uh, fortified plant milk. Um, <laughs> you know, they always include the black strap molasses, but I'm like, yeah! Um, fortified orange juice. Um, uh, again, all of that except the molasses, unless you're going to make some cookies. Uh, sounds delicious. Uh, and then, again, courtesy of Dr. Bussey, um, this just gives you um, uh, plant milks compared to breast milk uh, in terms of calorie uh, content, uh, protein content, um, and then you know cow's milk is also there um, um, by comparison. Um, and uh, um, again, um, because this lecture is being taped, um, you will be able to go back and, and study uh, these charts uh, in more detail. Um, but you can see that uh, soy is, is uh, uh, really uh, a, a nutritional star. Um, and uh, you want to be careful with the oat milk because of the uh, uh, glycosate uh, uh, content. And then uh, rice uh, because of the arsenic content. So let's talk a little bit about lactose intolerance um, because um, estimates put the average rate of lactase non-persistence uh, at about 75 percent of the global population so i, I want to make the point that it is normal to be lactose intolerant or not to uh, continue to make the lactase gene throughout your lifetime um, i am currently involved uh, with an effort to get the USDA to um, provide a non-dairy alternative for um, BIPOC children participating in the federal school lunch program, because right now the USDA requires black and brown children um, to have their parents take them to a doctor and have a doctor write a note or a letter to the school system that the parent then has to bring to the school system um, uh, requ requesting that they be provided with a non-dairy alternative um, uh, um, before they're eligible to receive one. And um, I told the USDA representative, being black is not an illness. How dare you tell these kids they have to get a doctor's note for something that is normal? I mean, it's just an outrage. I mean, that is the very definition of systemic racism, um, that you are punishing these children for not being white. It is disgusting. But that is where we are right now in America. That is the uh, uh, measure of the influence of the dairy industry, that they are forcing children to have to go. And, and since 
participation in the school lunch program is needs-based, meaning you have to be poor to be able to uh, uh, um, be deemed uh, eligible to participate. They're trying to force poor people to spend the money to go to a doctor to get a note saying they're eligible, that, 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 that they should be allowed to have uh, not be made sick by, uh, by, by, by cow's milk. I mean, it's just, it's just unconscionable, but that's where we are. But the fact is the majority of the people in the world, like all mammals, stop making the enzyme to digest lactase when they're not nursing. So that's what's normal. It's the Northern Europeans who are really the genetic mutants. So question, you got milk? Because if you do, then you just may have lactose intolerance. Most people in the world do. And that's why these people are trying their best to get into the bathroom. 75% uh, of the people in the world do, particularly people of color. Lactose. The sugar that's in milk is a disaccharide. Since only monosaccharides can be absorbed uh, in the small intestine, the uh, uh, disaccharide has to be split into the two monosaccharides in order to be assimilated. And that enzyme that does that is lactase. Um, it uh, breaks apart the glucose and the galactose uh, that uh, is the uh, two constituent sugars. Uh, again, most of the world uh, people are programmed to stop making lactase after they are no longer nursing. Symptoms of lactose intolerance include uh, bloating, cramping, um, gas production, diarrhea, and nausea, because once the um, lactose reaches the colon, the bacteria there have no problem digesting it, and they start to um, uh, break it down, and that's where the gas and the cramping come from, and then it pulls fluid into the colon, and that's what causes the diarrhea. So what about, you know, the dairy industry? You know, they always got something to say, and they say, well, you know, um, uh, milk has nutrients, and, and, and uh, um, um, you should uh, ingest cow's milk because of the nutrients. Well, first of all, I never refer to D3 or 125-dihydroxycalciferol as vitamin D because it's not a vitamin. It's a hormone that all humans would make if we got enough sun exposure. And the dairy industry started to put it into dairy products and call it a vitamin as a way of enticing people into purchasing their products. It's not a vitamin. It's a hormone. So please stop calling it vitamin D. It's D3. Okay. So it's put there artificially. It's not found there naturally. All right. Phosphorus, widely distributed and throughout uh, plant foods. So is magnesium. Find it in almonds and a bunch of other foods. Calcium, we've already discussed, is in widely distributed in plant foods. So is zinc. And um, uh, milk is full of animal protein, which you don't need. So I tell people all the time, drinking milk for its nutrients is like inhaling cigarette smoke for the oxygen it contains. It's a bad idea. Uh, animal protein has been linked to a whole host of diseases, including cancer, breast, prostate, colon cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, prion diseases like variant crucial Jakob, Alzheimer's and other dementias, high blood pressure, stroke, uh, kidney failure, kidney stones, dysentery, and other foodborne illnesses, both meat and dairy, um, uh, animal proteins, potent cancer promoter. It putrefies in our colon, releases toxins that can exacerbate uh, ADHD and other mood and behavior disorders. The amino acid composition of animal Protein raises blood levels of homocysteine, which can damage your blood vessels, damage your bones, and also potentiate dementia um, and increases the risk for heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, and osteoporosis. And when you send the wrong, wrong signals, that can lead to disaster. So I ask you, what at what point in these particular animals' lives do they eat animal protein? because it's clear that their natural diet is plants, right? Well, when I ask that question uh, to a live audience, most people say, never, they eat plants. Well, no, there is a point at which they eat animal protein, and it's when they're babies, when they're nursing infants. During their rapid growth phase, they eat animal protein in their mother's milk. And because of that, animal protein is a potent growth stimulant in plant-eating mammals. 
And that is an important point to always remember. Herbivorous mammals should only be exposed to animal protein during early infancy when they're growing. And because of that, animal protein is a potent growth signal in plant eating animals. If herbivores are exposed to animal protein during adulthood, the animal protein can activate oncogenes or cancer causing genes because they stimulate abnormal cell growth that leads to tumor development. And when you're constantly stimulating cells that should be quiet to try and grow, you alter the DNA and those cells transform into cancer cells. And um, people say, well, I want my cells to grow. No, you don't. You may want them to increase in size when you exercise, but you don't want them trying to grow because you want them to hypertrophy, which is increasing in size. You don't want them trying to grow because that leads to tumors and cancer. And um, the uh, early nutritionists got this completely bass backwards. Um, plant uh, and that's why they ended up thinking that animal protein was better than plant protein. It's not. Plant-based diets are often discussed in terms of being as good as meat and dairy containing diets. Again, backwards. Um, aggregate, aggregate research shows plant-based diets are and should be seen as the best diet for humans. Common myths and misperceptions that still exist. You can't get enough protein on a plant on a vegan diet. Not true. Plant proteins are not complete. That is absolutely not true. Animal protein is better quality. Vile lie. Calcium is hard to come by. We've already dealt with that. And it's difficult to build muscle on a vegan diet. Again, not true. So early nutrition researchers discovered that animal proteins had higher percentages of specific amino essential amino acids when you compare them to plant proteins. And, you know, human beings always think more is better. And so they said, well, since they had more of the essential amino acids, that meant that they had they were higher quality. They assumed that the closer the amino acid composition of any protein was to human tissue, that meant that that protein was a better quality. Well, if you think about it, that's a de facto argument for cannibalism, because why should I eat an egg when I can eat another human being? Um, for herbivorous mammals, um, animal protein serves as, as we see, saw already, a, proton, a potent growth signal and a growth stimulant. Animal protein turns on growth genes called TOR genes uh, and increases levels of growth hormones um, like IGF-1. TOR genes function as master regulatory genes for cell proliferation and growth. They also suppress cell death and those genes should only be um, active during uh, rapid growth uh, phase and, and when we're infants. And the most potent essential amino acid to turn on these genes is the essential amino acid leucine, okay? And decreasing animal protein uh, decreases TOR activity and also suppresses the hormone IGF-1. TOR genes are upregulated in human cancers and uh, human cancers are also covered in IGF-1 receptors. Uh, IGF-1 levels have been shown to be nine to 13% lower in men and women who are vegan compared to people who are meat eaters. And in a really important landmark study that was conducted over 18 years, the study showed that uh, people who had the highest intake of animal protein had a 75% higher overall mortality and a four-fold increase uh, in cancer death. So they had four times as much cancer and a 75% higher overall mortality. So you eat cancer, I mean, you eat animal protein at your uh, own risk. So remember, leucine was the essential amino acid that turned on those mTOR genes that caused the cancer. Well, let's look at the leucine content of things people commonly eat. And I'm, and notice I said things people commonly eat because the stuff on the right side of this graph really shouldn't be considered food. Because eggs are supposed to make baby birds. They really aren't supposed to be eaten. The flesh of animals are supposed to be meant to move them around, not really supposed to be eaten. Yeah, milk is supposed to be eaten by baby mammals, but it's not supposed to be eaten by humans. And when it's you, when it's eaten by baby mammals, yeah, it's supposed to turn on growth genes for those particular baby mammals, not for human beings. So it has a lot of leucine, so it'll stimulate those baby mammals to grow, but it shouldn't be stimulating the cells and adult humans to grow. 
Um, when you look at the things humans should be eating, you can see that grains and legumes have enough leucine to help us maintain um, our bodies and to even you know, grow appropriately, but not enough to turn on cancer genes. Um, so uh, again, animal protein increases both TOR activity and IGF-1 levels. Uh, animal proteins also have a much higher content of um, amino acid called methionine, which not only pr promotes cancer development, but it also uh, accelerates mitochondrial aging uh, and oxidation, which will um, make your cells uh, grow old and you with it. Uh, animal protein also accelerates kidney damage, increases heart disease, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, inflammation, and bone loss leading to uh, uh, inflammation. Then there are what are called estrogenic growth promoters in meat. In 1979, um, there was an epidemic of breast enlargement in Italian children that they traced back to the use of synthetic estrogens and anabolic growth promoters uh, that were fed to these farm animals to accelerate their growth rate. Because, you know, the faster they can get the animals to grow, they can get them in the market sooner, and they increase their profit margin. Um, the European Union banned the use of these drugs in their food supply, and they had to ban the importation of meat from America. Why? Because we continue to use this crap. Um, American agribusiness continues to use these synthetic estrogens and anabolic growth promoters, such as Xeranol and Ralgo Malgum. Uh, Xeranol is designed to be persistent, meaning it hangs around the tissues of the uh, meat of these animals even after they are slaughtered and sent to market. Xeranol is as potent in its estrogenic properties as estradiol, the primary sex ster steroid in women. And it's also as potent as DES, uh, which was a synthetic estrogen that was banned over 30 years ago because it caused reproductive cancers in women. In the absence of effective federal regulation, the meat industry uses hundreds of animal feed additives with little or no concern about the carcinogenic and other toxic effects of dietary residues of these additives. Uh, that's a quote from nutritionfacts.org. Uh, let's look at the estrogen and cortisol content in milk. Um, in each glass of milk, you've got uh, about 176 nanograms of estrogen and 76 nanograms of cortisol. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I pressed the wrong button. Uh, and over the lifetime of Western women, um, uh, this is one of the reasons that Western women have uh, more breast cancer than um, women in rural China, because um, the estrogen exposure is four times greater and the breast cancer is five times greater. A recent study of over 53 thousand of almost 53,000 North American women conducted over eight year period and uh, was published in the International Journal of Epidemiology showed a marked increase in breast cancer risk associated with milk consumption. Consuming a fourth to a third a cup of dairy milk per day was associated with increased risk of breast cancer of 30%. If you increased it to uh, one cup per day, the risk went up to 50%. Uh, for women who drank two to three cups per day, they increase their risk by up to 80%. Dairy product consumption is also the leading risk factor for prostate cancer uh, in the American diet. Harvard Health professional studies showed that men who drank more than two servings of milk per day had a 60% increased risk of prostate cancer. Uh, exposure to both natural and synthetic hormones and dairy products increased production of IGF-1 by the liver caused uh, because of dairy and animal protein consumption have been linked to increasing risk for breast prostate cancer, as well as testicular cancer and likely ur uterine and ovarian cancers as well. Lactose in dairy products has also been linked to a higher risk for pancreatic, ovarian, and testicular cancers. Uh, animal protein also increases levels of IGF-1, and this is in addition to the endogenous and exogenous hormones found in meat, research shows Elevated IGF-1 increases insulin resistance and may contribute to the development and severity of diabetes. IGF-1 levels are also known to increase risk for a variety of cancers by stimulating the growth of cancer cells. Elevated IGF-1 levels increase the risk for heart disease and can worsen hypertension and increase your risk for stroke. In men, IGF-1 may act on the testes, boost hormone levels, increasing risk for BPH and prostate cancer. So if you can't make it through the night without peeing, or if you go to the bathroom and you can't pee, 
could be all that IGF-1. Research has shown that men with prostate cancer have elevated IGF-1 levels, and that may be what's wrong with Mr. Rosenberg over here. Says your lab results look pretty good, but your testosterone level is just a tad high. Um, so I'm going to get Ms. Rosenberg off that dairy. And so here's our next video. In previous videos, we've had a look at the link between the consumption of dairy products and cancer, and in particular, ovarian, liver, prostate, and colon cancer. We've also seen the possible relationship between dairy and autoimmune diseases, dairy, asthma and rheumatoid arthritis, and the possible link between milk and multiple sclerosis, to name just a few. To watch those videos, check the description below. But what else are we not being told about when it comes to the consumption of dairy products and our health? Let's hear now from Dr. Michael Greger of NutritionFacts.org as he reveals some more disturbing truths about dairy. The number one source of calcium in the American diet is dairy products. The number one source of artery-clogging saturated fat, however, in the American diet is not beef, it's dairy products. Number one allergen um, in the food supply as well. So yes, cow's milk represents a substantial source of calcium, but it all depends on what baggage you want with your calcium. The kind of bonus you get with dairy is the saturated butter fat and lactose and cholesterol and antibiotics, pesticides, pus and manure. And if you're skeptical, when scientists test pasteurization protocols, they actually have to take the manure into account. Heat and activation of milk are contaminated with infected feces. To account for what happens naturally in the dairy industry, high concentrations of feces from infected cows were used to contaminate milk just to test their pasteurization protocols. There was even a pus study last year in the Journal of Dairy Science, kind of to ask the age-old question, can you taste the pus? Well, the United States has the highest allowable pus cell concentration in the world, can allow 300 million pus cells per tall frosty glass. Now, the industry, however, has always argued that it doesn't matter how infected and inflamed the udders of dairy cows are because of pasteurization. Right? It's cooked pus, so th there's no food safety risk. But what this study did was, well, can you taste the difference? That is important to industry. And so they made two vats of cheese, one with uh, U.S. milk and one conforming to the more stringent European standards. And the now with less pus cheese evidently tasted significantly better, at least according to this study. And speaking of pus, yes, zits. New Harvard study found so much significantly more um, acne in milk drinkers that it led a top dermatology journal to editorialize for what they call a no dairy diet, reducing dairy for anyone with acne to zero because of the hormone content in milk. There's no such thing as hormone-free, you know, milk, meat, or eggs, all um, animals produce testosterone and estrogen, and those steroids are deposited in their flesh and fluids. Harvard nurses study those eating dairy double their risk of having a heart attack. Or feed your kid lots of dairy and triple their risk of colorectal cancer 65 years later. So these were children that were fed dairy as kids 65 years later had triple the colorectal cancer risk compared to those that didn't have dairy as children. More dairy, more prostate cancer. More dairy, more testicular cancer. More dairy, more Parkinson's disease. Every single study ever done on Parkinson's and dairy consumption found increased risk of Parkinson's for those eating dairy. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment below and subscribe for more upcoming videos. So again, research showing a consistent link uh, between during prostate cancer, 12, 14 case control studies, seven to nine cohort, cohort studies showed positive link. Research has shown that meat, eggs, and fish also increase prostate cancer in a dose-dependent fashion. So regular consumption of large amounts of animal foods will increase the risk for fatal prostate cancer. Here's a graph showing skim milk. So it's not just the fat, it's the milk itself. Um, will also increase risk. And um, uh, what about the cheese? Wallet and grommet, it's, there's no cheese here. Um, that's right, they are going vegan. Um, 
Cheese is dangerous. Cheese and dairy, main source of saturated fat. Hard cheeses are uh, up to 70% fat. And this is what happens when you eat a lot of fat. You can see it settles out and makes your blood look gross. Uh, saturated fat in cheese and dairy increase inflammation and inflammatory compounds, uh, exacerbate and accelerate vascular damage, leading to cardiovascular, uh, heart disease, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and uh, can increase fatty liver disease. Cheese consumption, uh, as with other dairy products, will increase risk for uh, all of the usual suspects. And due to an overall decline in the consumption of dairy products, the dairy industry has increased the amount of cheese on individual products. They put the cheese in the crust. They're uh, tripling the cheese on each individual product. It's just getting ridiculous. Cheese is made from milk that often contains the pus, uh, feces, and blood, and all these other things, casein and whey. Uh, can cause allergic reactions, hives, rashes, chest pain, intestinal bleeding, anemia, and other problem, problems. Pro-inflammatory immune stimulatory compounds can also exacerbate autoimmune diseases. Casomorphins are morphine-like compounds derived uh, uh, from milk and uh, thought to encourage um, nursing in the baby calf, but in concentrated uh, in the cheeses, they can make eating cheese addictive. So let's uh, end up by looking at uh, can uh, vegans and vegetarians uh, build muscle? Because that's a big question. And uh, according to this cartoon, yes, they can. So looking at exercise and being plant-based, <clears throat> turns out that um, it's good for your endurance. So this study looked at um, uh, exercise, endurance exercise on a uh, meat and uh, uh, cheese diet, and the um, uh, athlete can only um, uh, exercise for an hour. When they added some carbohydrate, doubled the endurance time. But when they switched to a high carb diet, tripled uh, the endurance time. Now we're going to look at some vegan Olympic athletes and bodybuilders, uh, the largest land animals on earth. And the following athletes show it's not necessary to eat flesh to make flesh. So here's uh, Malachi Davis. He's a British Olympic 400 meters uh, uh, runner. This is Cara Rom uh, Romero, an Olympic soccer player. This is Mont Coleman, a vegan uh, bodybuilder from Oakland and author. Uh, Kendrick Ferris, Olympic uh, weightlifter. Uh, Mario Catley, uh, vegan bodybuilder, owns a gym in Oakland. Rebecca Sony, uh, Olympic swimmer, who's vegan. Uh, Namai Delgado, vegan bodybuilder, never ate meat in his life. Uh, Derek Treesize, uh, vegan bodybuilder. His wife uh, is also a vegan bodybuilder. Uh, this is a picture of him, Marcella Treesize, uh, the, the couple. And this is Dotsie Bosch, uh, 2012 uh, vegan Olympic silver medalist. A uh, study showed that um, uh, vegan, uh, plant foods help with muscle recovery um, and a variety of fruits, vegetables have been shown to preserve muscle mass and conditioning in adolescents and the elderly, um, and they uh, prevent severe post-exercise oxidative damage to muscles and promote fast recovery times and um, post-exercise soreness that are common after workouts and spinach, purple grapes, purple grape juice, black currants, and other berries um, um, are uh, noted. Uh, Derek Morgan um, improved his um, uh, uh, performance on field and helped uh, about 17, 16, 17 of his teammates um, go vegan when he was on the Tennessee Titans. And uh, they finally made the playoffs when they um, uh, a bunch of them went vegan. His wife uh, helped provide food for his teammates. Um, and uh, 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 they, uh, we have other stars such as uh, Novak Djokovic, um, who is vegan and opened a uh, vegan restaurant in Croatia. I just wish he wasn't such a knucklehead about being vaccinated. Uh, uh, Venus Williams is also a longtime vegan and helps and credits it with uh, helping to ameliorate her uh, uh, Sjogren's disease. Um, John Sally, um, 
uh, basketball player. Kyrie Irving um, is also a vegan, as is Damian Lillard. Uh, Wilson Chandler. Uh, Al Jefferson. Uh, Garrett Temple. Enos Cantor. JaVale McGee. Jaleel uh, Okafer. And one of my favorite uh, t-shirts, this is uh, Kenneth Williams, vegan bodybuilder. Go vegan and nobody get hurt. So in closing, much of what we have been taught and learned to eat has been heavily influenced by profit-driven marketing campaigns that do not have health as their primary concern. Our children are taught to gorge on the healthy foods until they come to resemble pint-sized Michelin men and then the adults in their lives throw their hands up in despair when they and we develop asthma, obesity, diabetes, constipation, depression, and other chronic ailments. But the chronic diseases that afflict us and our children did not follow from the sky at the behest of some malevolent God. They are the consequences of our own actions. As such, it is within our powers to choose to change our behavior and provide healthier alternatives for ourselves and our families. We were all born without preferences. No one ever asked for fried chicken, fries, ice cream, or pork chop in the delivery room. Everything we think we like, we were taught to like. We can learn to like healthier foods instead. We must do this for our own health and collective well-being, and also for the benefit of the planet and its other inhabitants as well. And we must get off the dairy death train because it is the most unnatural thing we do. Thank you for hanging out and attending this lecture. Dr. Mills, this is Ben from The Real Truth About Health. That was phenomenal. Uh, perhaps you're seeing some of the comments in the chat. You know, we've been doing this together for a few years now. I have a question for you. Sure. When are you going to stop beating around the bush and tell us how you really feel? <laughs> um, you know, oh my gosh. I just, uh, again, we just so appreciate your candor and what you're doing and, and what you're sharing with us. It is very eye-opening and uh, outraging. And, and uh, this is what we need to know. This is the truth. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that said, before we jump into the q and I want to make sure everybody has a chance to know, um, you know, if people want to learn more about your work or how to reach you or whatever that looks like, wh what should they do? Um, well, um, I have, I do have a website. It's uh, the title is kind of long, but it's real straightforward. It's Dr. Milton Mills Plant Based Nation.com. So it's just Dr. Milton Mills Plant Based Nation.com. Um, and they can go there, and uh, there's a lot of information. And then um, my webpage, I mean, I'm sorry, my Facebook page is Milton Renee Mills, um, just Milton Renee Mills. Renee is spelled R E N E. And they can also reach out to me there. Um, and um, I'm happy to connect with people there. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's fine. All right. Uh, Web page. So, yeah. Excellent. So everybody uh, take note. And, uh, and, and that's great. And thank you for that. And so uh, we have a, a few minutes before our, our 7 p.m. panel tonight. Got, got time for a couple of questions? Sure. Absolutely. We appreciate that. Thank you. So I know some people are already raising their hand. That's how we do it here at The Real Truth About Health. We don't really uh, go to the chat box. We ask people to raise their virtual hand uh, and get in line for a question. And so for those of you that don't know how to do that, um, down at the bottom of your screen, there are some tabs, your Zoom screen, and one of those tabs says reactions. You would click on the reactions tab and there's a, a function there that says raise hand. You click on that. We will see your hand raised. We are going to take questions, uh, raised hands in the order in which we receive them. And um, uh, once we do that, I will actually call you out by name and I will unmute you so that you can ask your question of Dr. Milton Mills. And uh, listen, we only have a few minutes, folks. We're going to ask you to keep it brief. Ask one question, keep it on point, And uh, we try to get as many questions in and, and as many people in as we can. All right. Ready, Doc? Yep. All right. Awesome. Great. Lightning round, like password. Yeah. So we're <laughs> So we're going to start with Ainsley. Ainsley, I'm unmuting you now. Hi, Hi doctor. Hi, doctor. And evening. I'd like to know, since you have all this information, why aren't you tackling Nestle and haagen Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, um, you know, if I could get to them, I would. That's all I can say. 
Um, I'm trying to tackle them indirectly by putting the truth out there and hopefully somebody will take them down. There it is. Um, yeah. Dr. Mills, I've got a few more questions coming in. Okay. Um, and so our next one is Joel A. Joel, I'm unmuting you now. Hi, Joel. Hi, everyone. Dr. Mills, uh, I'm a big fan. This was great. I really appreciate it. Uh, I had a question about the EPIC Oxford study that did show a higher incidence of fractures. And I wondered if you could comment on what might be deficiencies in that study, if you saw any, and also whether um, there are other studies that you are aware of that may have contradicted those results. Um, yeah, th first of all, let me say this, that yes, there were deficiencies in the methodology of the study. I don't, I, I don't have it in front of me right now, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. But what, let, what I can tell you is that whenever you have one study that's an outlier like that one, you have to realize that it's suspect. And um, um, it, it just, it, you know, when you have a mountain of evidence over here saying one thing, and then something crops up over here that says something different, there's something wrong with it. So, so I, I just, I would not pin my, 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 you know, I wouldn't let that one study scare me. The thing that just like kills me about vegans is we, we, we have, again, a hundred plus years of research that tells us we live longer, that we're healthier, that we are lower risk for diseases, that, you know, uh, we do better. And then all of a sudden someone comes over and says, oh, guess what? You have a slightly higher risk for stroke. Or guess what? You may have a slightly higher risk for uh, um, uh, a fracture. And then everybody loses their minds. It's like, people, please, how are you going to let somebody tell you that you're, you know, worse off when you know better? Yes, there's something wrong with that study. You know, um, check out Mike the Vegan. Mike the Vegan always takes those things apart and check uh, uh, go to his website. He has the definitive uh, read on that. He will give you what you need to uh, uh, tell you what's wrong with that study. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Mills up next, we have Stephanie P. I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on like soy products and tofu and stuff. I know that that's very controversial. No, it's not. No, it is not. Soy is incredibly healthy for you, okay? Um, it's like, again, I, I am, I'm on the second floor of my clinic because I couldn't, I got off at five and I obviously couldn't leave and do this lecture. But if the window was not sealed, I'd probably jump out of it. it, it it's like people talk about, oh, soy has phytoestrogens. Cow's milk has actual estrogen in it, Okay. The, the phytoestrogens in soy protect us because they actually stimulate our liver to make more of something called sex hormone binding globulin, which complexes our natural hormones and lowers the total amount of, uh, of endogenous stimulation from either estrogen or testosterone, number one. Number two, in women, the phytoestrogens block estrogen one receptor, which lowers the total amount of, of uh, estrogenic activity, but they actually activate estrogen receptor two, which gives you stronger bones and uh, helps protect you uh, against heart disease. Um, in men, they, they help reduce our risk for prostate cancer. Notice in China, Japan, places that eat a lot of soy products, they're, the men are not wearing bras, they are very fertile, and they have the lowest rates of breast and prostate cancer. It's incredibly healthy. Please, soy is healthy. Look at the meta-analyses. Look at all the studies. Eat your soy. I'm not saying eat nothing but soy, but don't be afraid of it. It's very healthy. Don't believe the nonsense. There's nothing wrong with soy. It is very healthy. It's been studied, you know, backwards, forwards, and sideways. Uh, uh, it is extremely good for you. Excellent, Dr. Mills. Thank you so much for that. And up next, I have somebody with the initials MA, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. 
Um, my question is about fish. Uh, I don't know. I read that they tell you to have fish, you know, once or twice a week. And those seniors that do have less, whatever, dementia or, or this or that. And um, I know farm raised fish is bad, but um, I don't know. Should I eat wild caught salmon once or twice a week or not? And why? No, 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 and no. Um, uh, let me ask you something. If would you eat the lungs from an animal raised in a coal mine? Yes or no? No. No. What? Right. Because it's if there would be black with, with tar, coal dust, right? right? There is no place on earth where the oceans or the rivers or the lakes are not polluted and not filled with all sorts of toxic, just toxins. And even wild caught salmon are filled with pollutants and toxins and um, uh, 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 pesticide residues and persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals. And the bottom line is it's animal protein. Animal protein, I, I showed you the graph, high in leucine. The leucine is going to kick start those mTOR genes, which, is going to, which are going to try and make your cells grow. And you don't need it. You don't need it. What do you want to eat it for? It's like, what? You, why? You don't need it. You will be healthier without it. So it will do nothing for you, and it will do a lot of things to you that you don't need. So no, leave them alone. Let them swim. You're good. Uh, excellent. Thank you very, very much for that, Dr. Mills. Um, looks to me like that was the last question we have. Um, we are. Oh, no, wait. Sylvester has a question. You got it. They, I saw it at the same time. Good. Oh, and a couple of more are coming in. Excellent. Uh, and luckily, we still have a few more minutes. So I'll go ahead and unmute Sylvester. Hi, Sylvester. Welcome. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mills. Uh, you're wonderful as always. I am truly admire you. I'm from Edmonton, Canada. I have a quick question, Dr. Mills. Uh, we, I, I have uh, 18 or 17 years old daughter, and I didn't know this information uh, before I met you. And when she was a uh, young girl, she always had a, a milk, you know, cow's milk, you know, we were almost forcing her, you know, drink. Now she developed very severe acne on her face. Do you think what we can do uh, she stopped drinking uh, after when I saw your lectures and all the information. She's no longer drinking, uh, but she has acne on her face. Do you do you have any recommendation? I and I think what you uh, Dr. Mills mentioned she, uh, is that I think that's related to what what uh, we did in the past. Um. So uh, is she is she is she completely plant based now? Uh, yes, we try to switch that. Yes, yes. Um, I would, I would just, you know, I would, I would just encourage her to, to maintain that plant-based diet to, okay. uh, really watch the total amount of, you know, fatty foods that she's eating to try and, and do as much raw as she possibly can and give it time to, to, to clear up. Um, um, she, you know, um, using, um, uh, things like, um, excuse me. Uh, some retin-A can be, can be helpful. Um, and, and to try and find a good plant-based dermatologist that could help, you know, with some maneuvers that could, could really help reverse that. But uh, that should clear up in time, I think. Because um, uh, as long as she's no longer uh, using the, uh, or consuming the dairy, that should, the, um, and she gets those things out of the, the dairy products out of her body, that, that should reverse itself in time. It, it really should. Thanks, Dr. Mills. Up next, okay. we have uh, uh, Ben, and we're going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Ben. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I got one question because today you got you talk a lot of the um, corn, the corn, the the beef, and I I saw many times, um, beef only eat almost the vegetable, 
Why beef is so strong, muscle, bone, everything's good. Also, the you know, the beef drink the water, they never boiling. They didn't talk about uh, some the no bacteria, but they still, I didn't see the beef. I still see the beef, the core, the core, and um, it's so strong. Or oh, what's the different from human, like all human, uh, all, we always think about uh, drink the um, pure water or something, so we still get a disease. Then we have the no calcium or anything, but the beef, they just eat vegetable. Um, why they muscle strong and the bone strong, they are bigger. <laughs> Oh, all right. I let me see if I can rephrase this. So you're you're saying that the 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 cows or the beef animals they they eat just plants yeah, and they're they really and they're really strong, right? Yeah, the no, there's no uh, some, there's no bone some from you see the the grower tall, the muscles strong. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I read once that if you want to be as strong as an ox, you should eat like one. And that's what I'm recommending, that we do exactly what they do. And that is eat the plants and drink the water and we'll be as strong and as powerful as they are, that we don't need to eat them because that's not good for us. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Mills. Up next, we have okay. a couple more questions and i um, going to unmute Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, uh, my question is about, uh, you, you mentioned the word regular consumption of, of, of animal products. Is there a reasonable consumption? And I, and I think I'm thinking more about the fact that we need B12, which comes from animals. However, they're probably eating out of an aluminum trough, so they're not even getting the B12. So what would you say about a reasonable consumption, especially for people who cannot really eat cooked vegetables? So... Let, let me, okay, let me be clear that all B12 is made by bacteria. No animal, no plant makes B12. B, all B12 is made by bacteria. The only reason there is B12 in animal foods to the extent that it's there is because the animals ate the bacteria. And the reason that we tend not to be able to get B12 in the, these artificial environments we've made for ourselves is because we've sterilized our environments and we've eliminated the natural sources of B12. So you don't need animal foods to get B12. You can take a B12 supplement. Um, and um, so I would encourage you to avoid the toxic compounds associated with animal foods and just take a B12 supplement. So my personal uh, opinion is that there is no reasonable intake of animal food. It's better to take a B12 supplement. Um, it's just healthier to do it that way. Doctor, that's great. We are up against the clock. We've got one okay. more quick question. If you could take it, can you take one more? Sure. All right, let's do it. This is our last one. And uh, Shashi, uh, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me a chance. I was praying to God that I should not be kicked off being the <laughs> last one. So uh, my question is, uh, I have been a vegetarian all my life, but last year we became vegan. And also became uh, low fat or no fat. And I, without doing anything, I lost 30 pounds almost. So my question is, yes, I am vegan, but I see that plants are genetically engineered. The manure is not compost or natural. And uh, there is um, so much of uh, uh, genetic engineering that Am I going to come up with some new disease that the um, industry is doing to get the pumpkin become six foot size and the cabbage become purple and all those engineering things? How would they affect us in, in spite of being vegan and uh, SOS? Um, well, one, you know, a purple cabbage is naturally purple and um, you can try and, you know, and, and make sure that you are avoiding um, uh, GMO plants as much as possible. Um, and um, I don't, I, I honestly don't think that you um, will have to worry about that. Um, 
as long as you're eating from a wide variety of plant foods and um, and try to avoid the GMOs as much as you can, um, you should be fine. Honestly, um, um, I I I know people who've been I I've been um, plant based for um, um, over 40 years and vegan for the last 22. And uh, um, I haven't had any problems. So, uh, and I know people have been vegan, um, um, you know, for years and no problem. So I don't think you need to worry about that. Just make sure you're eating a wide variety of foods, uh, plant foods and eating all the colors and you will be good. So for people who didn't get their questions answered, I am doing, I'm going to be part of the panel tomorrow night. Uh, 7 to 9.30, uh, bring your questions then, and we will um, answer them all, okay? Thank you, guys. We, we thank you, Dr. Mills, and, and sorry we couldn't get to every question, but yes, um, this has just been incredible. We appreciate your time. I'm, I'm not the only guy that wants to thank you. I know everybody else does, too. Tech team, can you unmute our uh, our audience, and what do you want to say to Dr. Mills? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mills. You are ready to you want to put it in the pan. You take the hand in your other hand and come right to the bottom of this.